Hey everyone, my name is Isaac Arthur and I'm a co-founder at Kodo Design in Indianapolis, Indiana and I want to welcome you back to our series where we are diving into some of the topics, chapters, and theory from our new book, Craft Beer Rebranded. You can grab your own copy of this book bundle over at craftbeerrebranded.com and you can learn how to navigate each step of your brewery's rebrand. Quick reminder, this is a 180 page book and a 60 page companion workbook that we wrote based on our decade of helping breweries brand and rebrand and we think that anyone tasked with the job of selling more beer will find this valuable. Again, craftbeerrebranded.com. Enough of that, okay. Uh, for today's video, I wanna talk you through or walk you through uh, brand architecture. So how can we use this to grow your brewery's footprint, portfolio, and brand itself? Uh, so as the beer industry continues to mature, we've worked with dozens of breweries who are opening a second, third, or fourth location. And, and you see this manifest as satellite tap rooms or purpose-built huge production facilities. Uh, we've seen breweries launch hard seltzer lines, kombuchas, RTD cocktails, cold brew, coffee brands, distilleries, restaurants, food trucks, music venues, event centers, bike shops, and even hotel concepts. And these leaps present complicated branding decisions that have to be made. And a lot of Kodo's work over the last several years uh, has revolved around helping breweries manage these decisions. So do you use your brewery name on this new location or do you make it more tailored to its the neighborhood that it's in. Uh, if, if we want to open up a new food concept, should we use our brewery name or does that even make sense if it, this is maybe a, a special one-off spot? Brand architecture will help you answer these types of questions. So your brand architecture is the framework you use to determine how all of your brands, you know, both current and future, interact with each other. Uh, how do these specific brands relate or differ? How are they positioned and named? And how are they priced? And how does all of this help you build your business? If you're a newer outfit, you may be thinking, why do I need to think about this if I just opened a brewery to make beer? And I get that, trust me, I understand. But if the last few years of the beer industry are any indication with breweries making everything from hard seltzer, kombucha, seltzer, cold brew, uh, RTD cocktails, all manner of other non-beer things, uh, and probably worth mentioning that all of that was before the current global pandemic that we're all fighting, uh, I would encourage you to think about what opportunities could present themselves uh, to you over the next couple of years, if not even six months at this point. So here are a few approaches to framing your brand architecture that you should consider as, as you think about expanding your portfolio. Uh, the first one that we want to talk about and the most common in the beer space is a branded house. So a branded house brand architecture centers around a strong parent brand that lends its name to all of its products. Your corporate name would be your parent brand in this case. Uh, if your breweries and your breweries products would support the overarching parent brand without each having its own unique identity. So this, qu very quickly here, this doesn't mean that you can't have individual fanciful names, uh, that's fine, but that all of these beers are easily recognizable as being from the same brewery. Uh, this type of architecture is the most uncommon approach that breweries come to market with because it's, it's simple, it's relatively straightforward. And to manage, and it helps you build a strong overall footprint and brand that will automatically lend trust to each subsequent release. Uh, an example of this, let's look, take a look at Prost Brewing. I think they're actually, oh, here, behind me. <laughs> uh, let's look at, a, at Prost Brewing out of Denver, Colorado. So uh, Prost has a flagship location in downtown Denver. Uh, and another tasting room in Fort Collins and an enormous purpose-built production facility coming online soon. Uh, Prost uses their corporate name followed by a style for all beer releases, which makes sense for German stuff. So there's no fanciful names at all. So it's Prost Pils, Prost Dunkel, Prost Weissbier, Prost Kolsch, Prost Kellerbier, and so forth. Their satellite taproom and production facility also bear the Prost name as well. And this consistency creates a very strong footprint with no room for interpretation or confusion as they continue expanding. The second type of brand architecture that you can consider is a house of brands. Uh, now, a house of brands brand architecture features a less prominent parent brand or one that falls to the background entirely. Uh, this enables individual brands to stand on their own without any direct ties to the parent brand itself. So traditionally, the stock and trade of mega corporations, you know, Procter and Gamble and Unilever and stuff like that, but it can be a valuable concept for breweries, craft breweries in particular, to employ as well, depending on how varied your product mix is going to become or is now. Um, an easy house of brands example would be AB InBev, right? So they're, they're, they are definitely a family of brands and they own, so it's AB InBev would be the, the top, uh, which kind of falls to the background. And then you have 
underneath their corporate umbrella. You have Budweiser, Bud Light, Corona, Goose Island, Ten Barrel, Golden Road, Breckenridge, I'm running out of fingers, uh, Wake and Weed, Elysian, uh, Devil's Backbone, and probably 25 other breweries by the time this video launches. Uh, these, are, these breweries are all run under the management principles and scale-minded growth plans found within Big Beer. But as far as the consumer is concerned, they're just hanging out there in the beer aisle, minding their own business and considering which cool new craft beer to grab for this weekend's cookout. <laughs> these beers all appear to be distinct brands, um, each with their own branding and IP and, and, and while competing with every other brand at every other price point style, I should mention. So uh, ah, the, the illusion of choice. Um, Here's an example that may be more down to earth and more applicable to smaller breweries that are watching this video. Uh, folks that don't wheel and deal in mergers and acquisitions on a daily basis. So Big Lug Canteen opened as a popular Indianapolis brew pub five or six years ago now. And Eddie and Scott, close friends of ours, uh, they wanted to reimagine what a brew pub could be. Taking it from this dark, overly serious space to a bright, poppy, fun experience with stepped up food. Really changing what bar food can be. Because bar food's traditionally garbage. So they wanted to change that. And this was a wildly successful concept. And, and three or four years, or I guess four years now later, they were able to open up a Bavarian, uh, Bavaria meets Indiana brew pub concept down the road called Leader House. Um, now this was a big move because purchasing the building that would house Leader House um, came with a large production brewery that was already there before they bought it, obviously. So this system, this big brew system, allowed them to start canning beer under the Big Lug Brewing banner. And then they opened Half Liter, which is a Texas barbecue and German beer hall concept right next door to Leader House. So there are a lot of things that happened very quickly there that presented a lot of challenging branding decisions. And the important thing here is that all of these concepts are within five or six miles of each other. Now, if, if Eddie and Scott had decided to brand everything under the Big Lug banner, you know, Big Lug 1, Big Lug 2, Big Lug 3, that would be stupid, number one. But number two, it would have confused customers and possibly cannibalized their flagship location. So by shifting very subtly uh, to a house of brands brand architecture and creating standalone brands, so you know Big Lug Canteen, Leader House, Half Leader, Big Lug Brewing, uh, Big Lug was able, Eddie and Scott, were able to evolve on the fly into Big Lug Hospitality, which would be the kind of behind the scenes parent brand. Um, and, a, and, and this house of brands architecture approach allowed them to uh, let each of their concepts flourish on its own while supporting the larger business itself. Um, this is really cool. And, and we're seeing another example uh, as breweries are releasing standalone seltzers and kombucha brands with zero tie to their parent brand. And, and I think this is smart because it allows you to get into an emergent category and increase your overall revenue, of course, while not risking your primary positioning as a craft brewery that, you know, makes beer. <laughs> so, uh, when doing this, whether you realize it or not, you are stepping into a house of brands brand architecture. So. Let's shift gears just a bit. Uh, as we mentioned, your brewery will eventually have the opportunity to grow your footprint through internal product ex extensions, new locations, standalone brands, external partnerships, and stuff like that. Let's discuss a few different approaches beyond the branded house and house of brands architecture that you can use, uh, so, so that you can use this stuff that we're talking about to directly grow your portfolio today. The first concept that we should discuss is a line extension. So a, a line extension, uh, lends, its uh, lends its established brand specific name to another product within the same category. So an example, beer A begets beer B, begets beer C, and so forth. An example that you see on the shelf maybe in, in a grocery store would be New Belgium's uh, Voodoo Ranger, and then Voodoo Ranger Juicy Haze, and Voodoo, Ra Voodoo Ranger Imperial Black IPA, or whatever the next derivation will be. Or uh, Kettle House's famous Cold Smoke, and then the Cold Smoke extensions so they have like a cherry and a coffee and a vanilla and stuff like that the thing that's smart about this is that new brand roll new brand rollouts can be expensive and and maybe even more so for regional and national players by the time you're through the package design process including design fees registering new trademarks printing thousands of cans and bottles and planning your on and off premise launch uh, you can be looking at a staggering number and this doesn't even count the time and treasure that goes into refining the beer recipe itself so what's worse is that this can often be a bit of a gamble. Juicy IPAs may be hot right now, but will they be a year from now? That's, that's, that's a bad example. Let's use Brute IPAs. Brute IPAs might be big now. Will they be big a year from now? Probably not. But again, 
Rather than risk rolling out a completely untested offering that may or may not land with your fans, you can leverage an existing brand's name and reputation to lend trust to that new beer right out of the gate, mitigating that risk and risk and hopefully achieving velocity sooner. Okay, I think there's one final piece here. Um, there's one final piece in the brand architecture puzzle, and that would be brand extension. So a brand extension is when you use your, your brand's equity. That is the amount of goodwill and recon, uh, recognition and trust that your customers have with your company. Uh, you use that stuff to create a new product category outside of your primary category. So a line extension, uh, again, lives directly within your beer category, downstream from an established product. So it's a, another beer with a similar name. Uh, while a brand extension falls completely outside, uh, though in a usually adjacent category uh, to, to you know, beer. So a common example could be a brewery opening up a distillery under the same or similarly themed name. So, uh, or that same brewery uses its spent grain to create a, a new line of candles or dog treat brands that for whatever reason are, are completely named, um, treated as a different company. So here you are leveraging the weight of your parent brand itself to lend credibility to that new product category. And the more established and respected your company is, the more effective this can be. One quick caveat, you are generally, that's not how you say that sentence. <laughs> you generally want to stay within the same general universe as your main category to achieve the best results. If you're making the best beer in the state, then you could probably make some pretty good whiskey too, at least from a customer's perspective, um, as far as what they perceive. That's not too big of a leap. Now, if you make the best beer in the state and you decide to use your brand name for um, a new boutique watch company or something cool like that, um, that might not compute with your customers. The, the qualities and promises that your parent brand offer should intuitively link in some way to your new extension. So. This isn't really set in stone. You can make or break these rules as much as you want, but the closer you stay to your category, the easier it will be for people to grasp what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> and one more caveat, I lied. Uh, while it may sound like a brand extension is a perfect solution for growth, we need to mention a potential negative side effect here. If your new extension isn't well received, uh, if you launch that new thing and people think it sucks, uh, your parent brand's reputation and positioning can suffer. Uh, think of this like a referral. We're all careful about whom we refer to our family and friends, you know, mechanics, lawyers, doctors, plumbers, even lowly design firms. And uh, because the service they provide is a direct reflection on us, the referrer, -er, refer -er, uh, the friend you're giving a referral to trusts you enough to listen to you. And if that mechanic botches your friend's car repair, uh, then, then your trust with your friend might actually be damaged a little bit. And likewise, if that new product you put your brewery's name on doesn't live up to your otherwise high standards, your customers can feel let down. I think that's it. There's no more caveats. That's, that's good for today. It's a long enough video. Uh, if, if in our next piece, uh, we'll, we'll kind of keep building on this, we're going to dive deeper into the brand strategy process and we're going to discuss how to frame your brewery's brand personality and essence. I want to thank you for watching today. Head over to craftbeerrebranded.com again. I want you to grab your own book bundle, buy it because they're going quickly, and we will be back with you guys soon. Cheers.